This is the You Winning Life Podcast, your number one source for mastering a positive existence. Each episode, we'll be interviewing exceptional people, giving you empowering insights, and guiding you to extraordinary outcomes. Learn from specialists in the worlds of integrative and natural wellness, spirituality, psychology, and entrepreneurship. So you too can be winning life. Now, here's your host, licensed marriage and family therapist, certified neuro emotional technique practitioner, and certified entrepreneur coach, Jason Wasser. My guest today on the You Winning Life podcast is entrepreneur Rick Sapio, CEO of Mutual Capital Alliance, a private equity holding company in Dallas, Texas, author of the book, Who's in Your Room, along with Dr. Ivan Meisner, who's the founder of BNI, and Stuart Emery, an influential leader in the human potential movement. Rick is also the co-founder of Business Finishing School, an online curriculum-based program that teaches entrepreneurs how to run a scalable and sellable business. Rick, it's an honor to have you here on the show today as one of my mentors and uh, really excited for the conversation that we're about to have. Thank you, Jason. You, you left off as a 55-year-old man on my first marriage. At home, I have a five-year-old, a seven-year-old, a nine-year-old, and an 11-year-old. And wow, does that make life interesting. I'm absolutely assuming it does because we are going to get into all of that as the story evolves for people to get to know you and all the amazing things that you're doing and the influence you're having out there. So before we get to that, being a, a husband and a dad, let's talk a little bit about your backstory as a child and as a college student. What inspired you, motivated you, and pushed you during that time frame from starting off as a little kid? You know, it, it, I think it's important for all of us to look back and understand our motivators. And for me, I've done a lot of counseling. Thank you for your profession. Um, and I'll try to make this brief. When I was a baby, uh, I was the seventh of 10 kids that my mother had. And uh, when my mother was pregnant with me, my four-year-old brother uh, got us, uh, well, he was three at the time, uh, but he got, uh, he was given six months to live. He had a rare form of cancer. So Right after I was born, my then four-year-old brother died. And my mother, uh, I held it against her my entire life that she was a bad mom because she had a nervous breakdown and never recovered. So, uh, you know, you think it's sad and it is sad, I guess, that, you know, I had this very difficult relationship with my mom my entire life, but it fueled me. It fueled me because... I had to prove that I was worth it because a lot of the drama and between my mother and I was, you know, why did Frankie have to die and not you? And that's a lot of pressure on a little kid. And then just to add insult to injury, when I was 13, my dad died and he was the only breadwinner. So um, I found myself in North Jersey with a large family and no money and no income at the age of 13. And so those, uh, Two very incredible <laughs> events look negative, but in truth, they were positive because I either had, I had a, a fork in the road decision at 13. I could either go into the, the gangs and mafia and all the stuff that was uh, North Jersey in the 70s, or I could focus on finding mentors to replace my dad. And one of those mentors, James O'Donnell, was an incredible influence on me. He said, look, you're smart. You can uh, do whatever you want in life, but I encourage you to get an engineering degree because if you get an engineering degree, you can be a doctor, a lawyer, you can work on Wall Street, you could be a business person. You don't have to be an engineer. And I didn't even know what that was. I, I don't know if that was a train engineer. I just didn't know. But it set me on this path of trust, which I want to talk a lot about later, Jason. So remember to ask me about that, that I'm 18 now, fast forward five years and uh, a letter comes in the mail. And I didn't get a lot of mail and I get emotional every time I tell this story. I don't tell this part of the story that often, but letter in the mail from the state of New Jersey. And it, uh, it was addressed to me in a pile of mail. And I'm like, what is this? And I open it up and it says, uh, dear Mr. Sapio, you are one of 10 recipients of an engineering scholarship to Rutgers University. I'm getting emotional now telling the story. I had no hope. And I get this scholarship to go to an engineering school of all things. And my mother's, I showed her the letter, I was excited, and she, she took the letter, ripped it up in front of me and said, you are working. You can't go to college. No one's going to college. 
And I had to make the break from my mom right then. And uh, I can say uh, with total integrity that I went and did my five-year engineering program at Rutgers and never looked back, never went home, stayed there the whole time and really was an adult. And you think about today, Jason, as a counselor, uh, parents today, if their kid falls down, they're rushing to put a pillow under their ass. And yet all of the... (laughs) chaos that we endured, me and my siblings, we all turned out pretty good. So that's a short version of a very long story, but it answers your question. Well, when I first heard this story, when we met uh, the first weekend that I attended business uh, finishing schools program was how relatable this is to the average person out there. So my background is I have a, I graduated high school with a 1.8 GPA, but I'm very proud of. And the idea of me having a successful therapy practice and mentoring and coaching was so foreign to me at that time that I always do go back and look back about all the people that were in my life that were mentors, that were inspiring me, that did believe in me in a way to help me get there And I'm always trying to bring that back into my practice and help them get past that. And I know you just mentioned mentorship is a huge theme in your life and something that I know you teach to everybody. And one of my favorite stories that you share is about this silent auction. So if you could please share that with everybody. Yeah. And it goes back to trust, which I'm going to add on at the end. If you remind me, I actually put a card in front of me that says trust on it. So, uh, 2008 happens. Uh, all of our businesses are at risk. I'm thinking, holy cow, my life's work is at risk. I was, uh, I'd started my company at 29 at the time I was probably 45. I can't remember. Uh, And everything's going to hell in the handbasket. Will the economy survive? Will the government survive? I think a lot of us forget that. So I decided to go out and meet billionaires that had been through chaos in their life. And uh, the first one I met was a guy named T. Boone Pickens, who I didn't know how connected he was. He had been very close friends with the last five presidents. And um, I had the opportunity through a series of events to meet him. And he invited me to his ranch. And we spent the weekend together. And I was so blown away by that experience. I said to my wife, this was in December. I said, my New Year's resolution is to meet 10 billionaires, self-made. I don't know that anybody's truly self-made, but you get the point. And so as luck would have it, I found myself in this charity event. Uh, It was the Entrepreneurs Foundation. And they would get local billionaires, I'm in Dallas, uh, to put their hat in the ring for lunch. And people at this event would bid on lunch and they would, uh, you know, so, uh, you know, Ross Perot, you put your name, I'll have lunch with Ross Perot for 500, 600, 700 numbers to get up. And the same week that they had this event where they had these, uh, six, I think billionaires listed to have lunch with was the week that Warren Buffett auctioned off lunch, uh, with him. And the winner paid, I think $600,000 to spend one hour with Warren Buffett and the money went to charity. So I'm like, wow, this is going to be expensive because arguably these people were of that ilk. Mm -hmm. People like T. Boone Pickens and Phil Romano and Ross Perot and uh, the Wiley brothers. Uh, Although he's not a billionaire, he was on the list. Um, uh, Herb Weitzman and Roger Staubach. And they would do these recurringly. But anyway, the point of the story is I was like, you know, when you put something out in the universe and you, and you trust, it's, it's magic. Uh, I love how if you want something bad enough and you trust the universe, the universe will conspire to bring that to you. But I think we just don't trust. So long story short, I hand my credit card to Pam. She was in charge of the event. I said, Pam, I have to go, but I want to be the, the high bidder on all these uh, billionaire auctions. And she's like, okay. And I was prepared to pay whatever. I, I knew it wouldn't be more than, you know, 40 or 50,000. But uh, when she called me the next day and said, you want all of them, how do you, you know, you know, how do you want to do it? I said, well, can you tell me the damage first? What did it cost? And it was 1500 bucks for all of them. Like people were bidding on Cowboys tickets, but not lunch with a billionaire, which was shocking. And I went into those meetings fully uh, wanting to learn from them and their mistakes. I didn't want anything from them like payment. And I had built a relationship with all of them. So that's the story. 
So how do we take that? Because of society right now, the whole big thing is social media influencers. And we, you and I, um, you know, see all around us, people investing or spending their money on products or things that don't allow them to get the results out of the life, the, out of their life that they truly desire, right? So people come to me all the time. I tell them my rate of what I charge. And a lot of times they'll come back and they'll say, wow, that's really expensive. And then I lay out the figures of, well, if you don't figure out your relationship with your spouse, this is on average what your divorce is going to cost you. This is before you have, you separate any property, right? Before any child, uh, right parenting plan and child payments and all that stuff right if you can't spend x this is what it's going to cost you how do we really inspire and motivate people out there to take this investment like you said it only cost you a certain amount of money that wasn't exponent right? exponentially you got all this results back from that yeah i think what we need to do is con- contextualize your question and i really hope people are listening to what what's about to come out of my mouth and i'm channeling a little bit too uh, what I mean by channeling is um, feeling what you're saying and feeling what the uh, listeners need to hear. But if we were to contextualize a, a continuum, this is zero and this is 100 if you could see my hand. So I think and I believe that my decisions that are long term oriented, think 100 years into the future, when I make decisions today that affect 100 years into the future, i.e., how will my kids turn out? How will my kids' kids turn out? How will my companies and investments turn out? When your perspective is really long-term, you tend to make much better decisions. So if I said to you, uh, uh, Jason, I want to live to be 120. If I want to live to be 120 years old, that's going to inform what I eat next, like right now. So I would argue that your listeners, the further out they go, in terms of how far out their decision-making is in their relationships, in their career, and in their health and fitness, the clearer those types of decisions become. And of course, they should have a coach and pay whatever it costs. I have, since the age of 21, maybe 22, but I think it's 21 in college, I have had continuously a paid coach. And I have paid if I told you the amount, I figured it out one yeah. day, how much I've paid on coaches and counselors, it is an enormous amount. So, you know, it's like this. If you, I said to a, an entrepreneur once, I said, you really need to pay to train your employees. And he said, well, if I pay to train my employees, they might go to a competitor. I said, so it's better to have untrained employees? Like, does that make any sense? The same goes for us. If we want to have a great life, we've got to pay for the training to have a great life and adjust our time frame. And to me, I would rather drive a crappy car, which by the way, I do, and invest that money into coaching and mentorship than drive a really nice car and not do that. So how can we help people make these decisions? I know that since I met you the first weekend, that the term values-based decision-making has been drilled into my head. And and now people who know me know how much I talk about core values. Um, how does this play out in your life? And then how can our listeners put this into play as well? Yeah. So this is something that can't be ignored. I've worked with thousands of people on this topic. So I believe the day you're born, and there's an old Vedic uh, uh, story about this Vedic astrology. I'm not an astrologist at all, but I do believe there's some truth to this um, lore that when someone is born, there's a star out in the universe that basically has their values and Mm. purpose locked into it. I believe that each human being, every single one of us has permanent values and a purpose that's inside their cellular structure. And when you live a life in alignment with your stated purpose and your stated values, it's like your life is a magic carpet Mm. ride, but people fight it. They fight and they do things that are completely counter to their nature, counter to their purpose and counter to their values. So step one is do the work, work with Jason or another coach and figure out, pull out of yourself, your values. My stated values are X for me. My number one value above all else by a mile is simplicity. Everything in my life I do revolves around keeping things as simple as possible. That means having one wife, one car, one house, one company, 
uh, which makes a lot of investments, but it's one company, no commute. And all the decisions I make revolve around how will this simplify our life? Now, I think almost every human being has that somewhere in their value set. But what do human beings do? They complexify the hell out of everything. And so anyway, I believe, Jason, the first step is to work with somebody and get your values out. Second step, every decision you make should be aligned with your values. Because I know for me personally, every lawsuit I've been involved in, every horrible relationship disaster I've had, started when I let someone or something into the room of my life that didn't align with my values. So I had to get hit over the head a lot before I realized, oh, values-based decision-making, which leads me to the next thing. I have found that people generally don't make the same mistake twice. And you've heard me say this before. Mm -hmm. They make the same mistake 40 or 50 times and they still don't learn. (laughs) So stop the insanity, everyone. Which is so spot on because when you talk about this concept of who's in your room, which is the title of your of your book, the vision that you you create and paint in the book is that imagine, right, you only have one room in and there's a doorman, right? And the doorman principle is one of the many topics that uh, is part of business finishing school's themes and, and, and that who you let in really determines the value and the success of your life. So I've started using that in my practice. And as you can see, I am sitting on some red couches. So I don't have a red carpet, but I tell my clients that if, you know, if they've made it this far and they're sitting on my red, on my red couches in my office, they must have aligned with the core values of the practice to get there. And I think that allows them to have an additional buy-in to the work that we're doing here. Absolutely. It makes your life easier. My coach once told me, this was 10 years ago, he said, uh, just listen to this song. And I'm like listening and he's humming it away. And I'm like, what is he humming? And he's going, <laughs> row, row, row your boat gently down the stream. He goes, I have news for you, Rick. Now, I don't even know if this is true, but it resonated. He said, that song was not written for kids. That song was written for people that want a great life. Imagine if everything in your life was aligned, it was aligned with your purpose and your values. It would be like rowing downstream. But what do human beings do? They fight and they row upstream and they try to change, you know, the universe by trying to change the present moment and change people. I have news for everybody. You will never change anybody or anything. You have to row with the tide. That means rowing with your values, rowing with your purpose, rowing with aligned people, just like Jason said. And this now plays into what you're doing with Business Finishing School. So let's talk for a few minutes about that. What inspired you to co-create this program um, and your hopes for entrepreneurs uh, out there that you're hoping will will participate in this program? And also, um, this word is tossed around so much today of what actually is an entrepreneur. And I know you have a, a really beautiful take on that. Yeah. So first, um, I did a lot of work many years ago to find out my cellular purpose was in this life. And it's why I'm with you now and why all of you are listening to this. It's because I exist to inspire entrepreneurship, period. And to me, the definition of an entrepreneur is anyone who decides to take responsibility for outcomes. The minute you decide to take responsibility for outcomes, any outcome could be a great marriage. It could be raising great kids. It could be starting a business. But the minute you decide to do that, you are being entrepreneurial because entrepreneurs work through obstacles. They take the resources that they have and they get things done. Okay. So, um, you asked me a lot of questions. I'm not sure. Uh, I got sidetracked a little bit, but the, um, the, Part of our program and why we started it was to get people to figure out what their purpose is Mm -hmm. and then create a catalyzing statement about their purpose. And a catalyzing statement is something that inspires action. And to me, purpose is to inspire entrepreneurship. A catalyzing statement for me is an entrepreneur in every home. And if you think about it, there's about a billion homes in the world. So we started a charity called A Billion Entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And... 
What I do for a living, which relates to why we started Business Finishing School, is we invest in companies. And over the last 26 years, we've invested in over 100. But we couldn't find entrepreneurs and businesses that knew what the hell they were doing. And so we decided to, since we've looked at thousands of companies in order to invest in the 120 or so that we have, we decided to say, look, here's the blueprint. Here's the blueprint to radically simplify your business and personal life. Here's the blueprint to increase the probability that you'll be successful. And here's the blueprint to leverage your existing infrastructure and your key relationships. So simplicity, probability, and leverage became the operating values for the program, for the people in the program, and for their friends and family that are involved. And so the reason I did it was it aligned with my purpose. And I really just wanted to teach because we wanted to find more opportunities. And it's been, uh, we've had over, uh, actually, we're coming up on our 16th event. By the time people hear this, it will be six months from now, potentially. And that will be the 17th event. We do them in Dallas in the center of the country at a nice Marriott. And they're called uh, the Business Finishing School Growth summit. I think I got all your questions. I'm not sure. I think you did, at least in that in that little segment there. So when it talks about this idea of d- this, this long-term luck, this desired outcome for life, to have a healthy relationship, healthy parenting, healthy business, where do creative outlets fall into play with all of this? Especially you for creative, you. Uh, creative outlets. Yeah. So hobbies and uh, artistic resources, right? Because I know that everybody talks about this work life balance. And yeah. um, was it Keller? Uh, was the, the book, uh, The One Thing, right? What's your priority? And then focus your life around that and create structures around that. So for you as an entrepreneur, someone who, who's also, you know, very much defined, you define yourself as much as a family man as you do an entrepreneur. Yeah. How do you take all of that and put that into play with this work-life balance? Well, I'm going to give you the secret to life as I see it. Now, I tell people all the time, you don't have to take anything I say as truth, you could ignore it all. You can continue on life as you are. Great. However, if you want simplicity, probability of achieving the outcome, and leverage, which means you're now getting much more result from the same uh, investment of time and money. If you want simplicity, probability, and leverage, then I would encourage you to do what I'm about to say. So here's what I learned. So I went on to interview now 44 billionaires. And what I've learned is that they all have this same exact thing that I'm about to tell you, and they don't even know they have it. So if you were to follow any human being around with a video camera from the minute they wake up, whether it's 6 a.m. or 8 a.m. or midnight, whenever they wake up, to the minute they go to bed, you just follow them around with a video camera for a week. You check the box and what are they doing every minute? you would find that the vast majority of people, about 90% of what they do in a given day is absolutely counter to their values, their objectives, and their purpose. Billionaires, however, or people that produce massive impact, I mean, I don't care if we're talking about the Dalai Lama or Brother David or anybody uh, that's produced impact, they generally only do about five things. So I use my hand as an example. And for me, I've it's told everybody close to me, and I'm telling you, Jason, you could kick me in the kneecaps if I'm not doing this. If I'm awake, I only want to be doing these five things. So those five things are being a committed husband and father. That's number one. Number two, working on my health and fitness. Number three, my purpose work, which is my company and stuff like this. Number four is um, building key relationships or uh, basically Uh, reinforcing key relationships. And lastly is learning and growth. I'm really passionate about learning growth. Now, what's not on here is Netflix, is TV. We don't have a a connected TV in our house. Is toxic relationships, golf, things like that. For me, they're not there. Now, what I've learned is, uh, by the way, my hand represents my creator. We all came from somewhere. I just have to look at my hand and say, is what I'm doing, does it fit? on my hand. And if it doesn't, it's probably the wrong thing. Guess what? All my kids know what's on my hand. My wife knows what's on my hand so they can hold me to a higher level of accountability. So here's the thing. Life works when I do these five. Life doesn't work when I do things that are not on these five. And so that's the secret to life. And you know what most people say? (gasps) I can't get rid of Netflix. So yeah, I would say, would you rather have row, row, row your boat 
or would you rather have Netflix? You choose. Right. And I think your quote was it simplicity on the far side of complexity, right? Yeah. It's well, Oliver Wendell Holmes. Mm-hmm. I wouldn't give a fig for the simplicity on this side of complexity, which is where most people live, but I would give my life for the simplicity on the other side of complexity, which is where people like Richard Branson and Warren Buffett live. So if people wanted to invest a little bit more in themselves and their business, and they wanted to come to a weekend in Dallas with us, uh, right? It's usually twice a year. It's rich, right? Ritualized, rhythmed in rituals. Um, what would they expect to get out of the weekend? What would a weekend look like? And what would they expect to take home with them on a Monday? Yeah. So we're very committed to not giving people a state experience change. So if you go to uh, a rah-rah Tony Robbins event, um, you're going to have a state experience. You're going to feel high for the weekend. I'm much more interested in a permanent state change. Whereas after that weekend, you will never again, as long as you live, revert back to the habits and rituals that you had prior to that weekend. And I've had so many people over the years say, you're right on. Like literally, I now know my values. I'm making decisions from that. I now know my life purpose, my life objectives. I realized I married the wrong person. I've heard that before. I don't want to be involved in that, by the way. <laughs> Marry the right person, please, so I don't have to feel guilty. Um, uh, by the way, this is a total side note story, and my sister's going to get mad at me for telling, me, telling everybody this. But um, let me just say it's my cousin make it easier. Cousin comes to me and says, well, you know, my, uh, my son's getting married. You know, what do you think of my son's, uh, potential wife? And I'm like, why are you asking me that? Like my opinion matters to you. And so, yeah, it, it matters to me. So I said, great. Um, the, the person has never worked ever. Uh, they're an only child. So they're a spoiled brat. They smoke pot all day long and their values aren't aligned with your son. So I think it's a horrible idea that they get married. But, you know, so then uh, my cousin didn't talk to me for two years <laughs> because the truth was like an interesting thing. Uh, so, of course, they get married and it was a horrible marriage. So my point is, when you're making important decisions, who you marry, who you partner with, who you live with, uh, who you become friends with, Make sure there's a values alignment. It will save you and that other person and humanity so much collective time. And it's so interesting. I wanted to share this story with you as we wrap up. We're at a couple that came recently and there were some things going on in their marriage and they were a young couple and really excited to be tackling the world in their early 20s. And they had this very specific issue that they were coming in to solve. And they were adamant about just talking about that issue. And based on everything I've learned from business finishing school and from you specifically is that I can't talk to you about what you want unless I know what your core values are, Mm. right? So I had them go home between session one and session two, each of them sit down with the worksheet from, from uh, module one, from, from the program and say, come back with your five to seven core values and your definitions. And I want you both to do it individually. And then once you do that, I want you to sit down together as a couple and I want you to come back with your relationship core values. So the issue that they would typically come in for would be a long-term three months, six months, 12 month trust related based uh, couples counseling. Within four sessions, they're like, I think we're good. I think we realized why things ended up the way they ended up, where we're at, and what we need to do. And it all went back to abbreviating everything with just having a clarity of core values. And, mm-hmm. and, and I want to thank you for, for, for pushing that and inspiring me specifically for the people out there who, who personally know me and know the transformation that I've had. There's two things in my world that I really... Um, can be massive gratitude for since I've become a practitioner is one is this thing called neuroemotional technique, which is this mind body modality that I'm a certified practitioner in. And two has been this, this business finishing school. And then the, the, the story I tell is that there was a practitioner who uh, you and I discussed when we first met for two years, tried to convince me to come to your program. And Mm. the first week, and I'm like, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm a therapist and a healer. You know my family, right? So, you know, there's the the third generation family furniture business. And I kept running away from this identity of being both a therapist and a healer with an entrepreneur. And once I got that lesson from you of being aligned with my core values, taking accountability and running with it, life has had a radical transformation. And this is possible for people who are out there listening. And this is really what the purpose of this whole show of you winning life is about. It's not about the Lambos and the Ferraris and the yachts. That's great if you want to get those things. 
if it aligns with your core values, but really having this simplicity and living and having people in your life such as you and Matt Monero and these other people that have been so crucial and inspirational in my life that allows me and allows me to give back this information to other people out there. So I really want to thank you for that. I love it. I want to add something to something that you said. So I believe if you go back to 200,000 years of human history, there's a, 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 we'll call it a strain, a DNA strand, a D- DNA strand of humans that survived. And it's the humans that are alive on the planet. Now, there are other humans that didn't survive for whatever reason. Maybe their, their DNA said their lifespan was 10 years. I don't know. But one thing I fundamentally believe, and uh, you could uh, decide if this is true or not for you, I believe that at our core, us as human beings, we're all entrepreneurs. We had to be entrepreneurs. This strain of human beings, the, the ones that became us, we're entrepreneurs. We had to uh, uh, divide and conquer as families. You're going to go get the buffalo. You're going to go dry the meat. You're going to go make the clothes. You're going to go find the next place that we're going to move to. And everybody got up in the morning with a purpose. I think that industrialization killed entrepreneurship because people are like, no, I got to get an MBA. And then if I get an MBA, I need to get a PhD and I need to live in this area and I need to marry this type of person. That is killing entrepreneurship, which is our in my opinion, our, mo- our molecules are aligned around entrepreneurship. <clears throat> the second thing about relationships, totally separate topic, and maybe we can do another podcast, sure. but <clears throat> I think that people get married. This is what happened with my cousin. <laughs> Rick, everything you just said, values-based decision-making is all bullshit. They're in love. <clears throat> and I said, two young people in love should never get married. (laughs) That is absolutely ridiculous because marriage is a commitment for life in which love does this. Mm -hmm. It goes up and down. So does that mean when the love's gone, you get divorced? (coughs) I think love, I made a list once. I don't have it in my head, but all the things you need to have a great marriage, values alignment, a purpose alignment, um, objectives alignment, parent alignment. Love was 10th. Mm. Yeah. And Dr. John Gottman, I'm not sure if you're familiar with who he is, but um, he's one of the top marital researchers in the world. And he f- created this whole list of shared meanings and dreams that those are one of the core foundations for what he calls a sound marital house. You have to have a love map. How familiar are you with the things that are going on in your partner's life, right? Their best friends, their stressors, their dreams, uh, right? If they won a million dollars, what would they would do with that? All these different things. And these are things to check in with kind of like oil changes on your car. You should check in with your, with your partner uh, throughout this time frame. But the other thing is, do you have shared meanings and dreams? Mm-hmm. Is your vision for the future, for the long-term plan, like you were talking about before, in alignment? Absolutely. And love is going to come and go. There are going to be times where you walk home and you're like, I don't even like that person. But we have similar dreams, values, commitments, and I have fun with them when we do this, this, and this. So then what happens is your, uh, your short-term, remember I was doing the thing mm-hmm. before, your short-term uh, concern goes away and you start focusing on that hundred year vision of what you want to be with your spouse. So this is deep stuff. Well, thank you. I know that our time has been, is limited for today, but I know that there's so much value and much more value that we can extract from the conversations. And I want to invite people out there to really do everything that Rick was sharing with us today. Figure out what your purpose and passion is. It's something that I talk about consistently with my clients. Like I said before, I can't help you find what you want with like solving a problem if I don't know where you want to be in the bigger picture, but also helping and finding a way to invest in your professional life. And it doesn't mean that you have to be the business owner. You can be an entrepreneur or you can be the person inside the business who can help it grow and with more simplicity, probability and leverage. And one of the places to do that is the program that I myself have been doing for the last two years uh, through this, uh, through Rick's program called Business Finishing School. And we invite everybody to check that out and there'll be more information about that in the show notes. Rick, Really, thank you from the bottom of my heart. Really glad that you're able to spend some time with us today. And I'm looking forward to seeing you in a couple of weeks. 
You're welcome, and you are an awesome interviewer. I love your style. You're like you're, you have you have a radio voice for sure. It's awesome. Congratulations. Thanks. Thank you so much. All right, Jill. We'll see you on the next episode of the You Winning Life. Please make sure to follow us on all platforms that you can find a podcast on, and you can check out the actual video replay of this interview on YouTube by just searching in You Winning Life. Thanks for listening to the You Winning Life podcast. If you are ready to minimize your personal and professional struggles and maximize your potential, we would love it if you subscribe so you don't miss an episode. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at You Winning Life.